Um, thanks so much for being here. The idea of this panel is to connect the uh, theme of the conference, um, credit booms and um, sort of the, the uh, what's driving the credit cycle, getting deeper into that, uh, translating that or bringing that to the present. So we thought we have one uh, start kick of the day with uh, two uh, eminent guests. Um, to my left is Trent Reason, who is a BCG, Global Topic Leader for Financial Stability of Central Banking, Capital Markets. Uh, has been a chair of the Systemic Risk Committee, the director of the Treasury before, and um, Till Sherman, who is a partner at Oliver Wyman here of the Financial Practice Office, and can I call, call you Mr. Stress Test, um, a, a seasoned bank stress tester, uh, worked at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York before. And what we want to do is we want to talk about the current situation in, um, in, uh, in credit markets, in, in, in capital markets. We want to like find out to uh, discuss where the risks are. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk, especially about the leveraged loan market and, and worries there. And I wanted to ask Till to kick off and um, maybe give us your impression. Is that, um, um, is that sort of the, the <coughs> part of the uh, financial system that is the most risky at the moment? And how big is the problem, maybe sort of the first order problem, but also the potential knock-on effects on the wider parts of it? Right. Thank you. OK, that sounds great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an honor to be here at this, uh, this conference and on this panel. Um, so I want to talk about the three things as a way of kind of working my way towards, uh, towards what the, the four of the questions. So the first is um, uh, the question about bank capital. Uh, is, is there you know, is there a lot? Is there enough? Um, and then the second one is about corporate credit, uh, with a, I think a particular focus on leverage finance. Uh, and then third, uh, I want to uh, have us start thinking through um, how all this might react conditional on a macro shock. Uh, and then Michelle's going to give us a probability of when, when that macro shock is going to come. So um, maybe to start, uh, you know. Uh, to start with the obvious that banks are a lot more, uh, cap much better uh, capitalized. The capital ratios are double what they were about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, almost all of that additional capital has come in the form of high quality uh, common equity. So, uh, you know, that's nice. There's a lot more of it. Um, but is, is there enough? Now, this is a sort of question that I'm not going to be able to answer. It's not obvious to me that it's even answerable. But one way to think about this is through the lens of no shock here, stress testing. Uh, and in particular, the USC car program. Um, uh, the results from this year, the quantitative results are going to come out today after the markets close. Uh, so I'm going to refer to last year's results. The amount of capital that the banks have participated in the stress test last year, and they represent almost 90% of the US uh, banking, uh, uh, banking assets. Um, uh, uh, indicated that those banks had more capital after the stress than the entire U.S. banking system had going into the uh, into the crisis. So, you know, that certainly gives me some comfort that the banking system is pretty robust in the U.S. and is going to be able to withstand you know a, so a shock as sizable or more because the stress scenarios that are run are worse than what happened during the financial crisis, which is a desirable thing. So. So <clears throat> sort of that's, that's one, let's keep that in mind. The second is, let's move over to credit markets. A couple of observations here. So first, um, the uh, trend that market-based finance is growing uh, and becoming more important continues. So if you look, for instance, compare how uh, the share of um, market-based finance for private <coughs> financing uh, in 2008 it was about half uh, relative to banks, it's now closer to 60%. <laughs> So banks are playing a smaller role. They're better capitalized, but they're playing a smaller role. And if you then dig a little bit further, uh, the problems are more in corporate debt than they are in uh, consumer debt. Um, the, within investment grade, uh, the, the rating that's grown the most of, and by a long shot is the triple B or BAA rating. So uh, a lot of uh, institutional investors have you know, guidelines. You can only invest in this class. Investment grade is certainly one of the classic guidelines. Uh, yields are really low, so what do you do? You chase the yield. Uh, you still meet your mandate by going to triple B. That's the that's the layer right above uh, right above high yield. That has quadrupled uh, since uh, since the crisis. <clears throat> um, 
in leveraged finance, which is all that is uh, high yield, essentially most of that is single fee rated uh, or would be single fee rated. Um, that uh, has grown to where it's almost the size of the high yield uh, bond market now. It's uh, outstanding of about a trillion dollars. So, um, so that that should that should worry us a little bit. We should actually worry even a little bit more because uh, the corporation, the uh, borrowers that are being financed with leverage finance are getting more levered. They have lower liquidity, and uh, probably what's most dramatic is um, the investor protection, the, the uh, lender protection that's on there. So, so-called covenant light loans have gone from about a quarter of all uh, leverage loans uh, back ten years ago to eighty-five percent now. Um, and that, so the bulk, the vast bulk of leverage finance is so-called covenant light. Uh, what could go wrong? <clears throat> so, um, uh, where is this stuff going? So a lot of this, most of it is going uh, to uh, invest into non-banks. Uh, that is to say, uh, CLOs, for instance, are very large buyers of this. <clears throat> And banks are actually, their main role in this is not to hold it. Um, uh, they hold uh, less than 3% of the market. Their role is more to, to help with the uh, construction of these to originate and then pass it on. And even here, the warehouse lines, which is a mechanism by which this happens, uh, have gotten much more modest relative to the crisis. So it's about $20 billion outstanding now, uh, relative to over $200 billion back in 2008. So, so far, so okay from the perspective of banks. So, yes, there's a lot of uh, increased risk in this, but it's happening largely outside the banking system. Now, the trouble is, what now, this is third, but what happens to condition on a shock? So here, one of the things we have to worry about is the financial accelerator effect. So the idea basically is, there's a shock, <clears throat> and to what degree is the pullback of lenders, the financers, going to accelerate any of that shock through the, through the, through the economy? Non-bank finance is much more likely to pull back. They're much more fickle. So um, they're going to be very sensitive to any shock, which means that the banks are going to have to carry the, the load in helping, uh, in helping weather this shock. But they bear a higher burden now because the share of lending is actually, that banks have is actually less. So we're going to need to count more on banks to do that. Now, they have a lot of capital, but how that all is going to play out is quite uncertain and you know should worry us a little bit. So on that up, we know. Well, Over to Trent. Maybe um, you have, uh, like, um, you know, with your Washington experience, maybe bring in sort of yeah. lots of the regulation, the regulators view. Are so there I, pockets that are? Yeah, I, I have an interesting perspective, having been on both sides of the football. To use an American phrase, um, having been in capital markets, trading leverage loans and CLOs, and then working on policy related to it. And I think that I, I agree with a lot of what Till said about the resiliency of the banking system. Obviously, a lot stronger, a lot more capital. They're dissuaded from doing what I call being in the storage business of holding a lot of super senior or mezzanine or even or loans outright. They they're, they're rightfully should be in the moving business and, and I think uh, of moving risk into pockets where it's uh, desired. I think putting, putting that systemic lens on it, um, I have to think about sources and uses. So where are funds going? Um, are those channels durable? Can they do they have strong hands to be able to uh, to, to, to support losses in the event of a shock? Um, and then the second thing is, what's the velocity? Because um, if you think about the, the history of crises, there's always a maturity transformation element. There's always a leverage element. Those two things come together, you know, um, and 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 create um, explosive panics effectively. And so if we think about, let's just talk about channels. A lot of these different, uh, particularly if you think about syndicated loans, they are moving into private funds. They are moving into CLO structures. And as we saw in the last crisis, CLOs were one of the only vehicles that started with a C and ended with an O that were actually performing reasonably well on credit, not on liquidity, but on a credit basis. So to the extent that AAA, AA type bond, bond holders were made whole through the cycle, they were made whole. Um, there were uh, liquidity disconnects in terms of price action of those traded notes, but, but predominantly these are term vehicles, meaning that they are match funded in terms of the note duration and the underlying loan duration. They don't have market value triggers like we saw with ABCP or SIVs or other kinds of uh, uh, animals in the crisis that really were accelerants of forced selling and of fire sale type behavior. 
Um, so that's one important thing to note. The other is, is that the predominant owners of those CLO type structures tend to be both private funds that are private equity type holders at the subordinate level. And at the senior level, there's insurance companies, there's pension funds. So these are long duration type holders that are not subject to um, redemptions at a day's notice, right? These are, these are folks who are interested in long horizon type investments. So from that perspective, that from a systemic perspective, that makes me feel a lot better uh, that there aren't those types of, of triggers. That said, um, I am concerned about some of the Cove Light issues um, with respect to uh, just lightning covenants all over the place. That, that's been something that has really just been a fact of reaching for yield and allowing more, um, you think about it as letting people into the party, you know, it's like letting the rowdy people kind of come into the party that could really disrupt everything. Um, going back to the old thing about the punch bowl and policy. Um, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a key area of concern. The other area of concern, and I, I spent a lot of time working on this in Washington, is around mutual funds and the retail sector. And the, and, and the, the fact is, is having retail investors who have access and treat uh, leverage loan type funds almost as a depository type uh, investment, that's concerning to me. Um, because I think that that's something where um, you know, we're likely to see a similar kind of a run event as we saw in money market funds going back to 2008. So, and I mean, it's, it's to some degree like you're both agreeing the risks are sort of contained and then, and, and, uh, of course, we like wind back a little bit and, and, and before the crisis, um, the risks were also there, but maybe not well uh, um, uh, appreciated and well seen. Do you think like from a regulation perspective, regulators have a, have a good sense of where the pockets of risk are, the, these new things cover? I mean, we, after 2008, we all of a sudden discovered yeah. that didn't really have that map where the risk where well, uh, uh, have we have improved the simple ant form PF doesn't tell you very much. <laughs> but I'll just say that. Like when we think about the SEC and hedge fund exposures and the funds that invest in these types of investment, it just doesn't tell you very much as a supervisor, as a regulator. I do think that there is a need for more um, and not self disclosed but but more uh, supervisory information and regulatory information about the types of activities the types of different leverage constraints, or if there are no constraints, market value triggers, all of these different things, just to even understand where the bodies may be buried. Because as we saw in, in 08, uh, there was just a complete blindness to a whole vast array of, of securitization and secured funding, which felt like it was in strong hands, but it dissipated immediately. I don't know. Yeah, so just, um, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, so um, uh, the regulators have, Without question, a lot better handle on risk and, just, uh, and knowledge about risk in the banking system. Mm -hmm. It's not obvious to me that they know any more outside the banking system. And because market-based finance is, has grown more than the banks, they know more about the shrinking part. Right. So um, maybe let, let me ask the last round of questions, and we open it up so you can um, uh, prepare for questions. The current moment, um, if you look sort of broadly across asset markets, and there are many people here in the room who've worked on asset pricing, on financial cycles, on, on risk, sent risk sentiment and risk appetite, um, it would seem like if you look at the stock market valuation, if you look at um, the lending market, the covenant light issue, it would like seem that we are in many respects at like peak mm -hmm. risk love. Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that statement? And then where do we go from? Is this just going to be this yeah. soft landing scenario that everyone? So I, I said something. I said something like maybe two or three years ago um, to to some clients in the in the in the credit space about we're on the eleventh inning of this credit cycle. That was three years ago. I mean, I, I'm I'm blown away having been in the credit markets for twenty five plus years at how extended this cycle has been. Um, every time I think that we're about ready to have a tipping point as far as defaults or recidivism rates, whether it's in consumer or mortgage debt or other uh, corporate debt, um, it, the, the music just keeps playing. So I, I am concerned that we're kind of on that precipice. Um, that said, I think that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm very heartened by a lot of the work that was put in place post-DFA, post-crisis around the resiliency of the banking system um, and in terms of being able to absorb losses. Because I, I do... I do think that the, 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 the median outcome is to come out to a place where it's a normal credit cycle. It's, there, there is going to be an increase in defaults and losses. Um, there will be some tightening of standards, but it's not going to be the 50 or 100 year flood that we saw in 08. 
still using. So I don't have uh, any, I, I completely agree with your sort of outlook about probability and so on. And it is remarkable next month we're going to be, it will mm -hmm. now be the longest uh, post war expansion that we have experienced. Um, I want to pick up on something that you mentioned um, earlier about CLOs, because what I'm more worried about is what we think might happen if there is a shock. Right. So what kind of, well, what are the behaviors of borrowers going to be like? Um, you mentioned rightly that CDOs, uh, CLOs actually perform very well. <clears throat> and so it's no accident that that's growing very well because you know, we, that's, it worked very well last time, everything else went up to hell, so let's grow this. <clears throat> auto was similar, auto uh, <coughs> actually did very well during the crisis. Uh, used car prices actually exited the uh, crisis higher than they entered. Um, uh, and auto finance has grown a lot. This is not entirely unlike uh, subprime lending early in the 2000s. So uh, early in the 2000s, people made the observation that, I don't know how many of you remember Altay. Right? So Altay is a little bit better, a little bit better than subprime. We used to call it scratch and done. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice, exactly. So that, that class performed worse in the sense of uh, credit losses than subprime. What do you do with that information? You pile into subprime, obviously. And by doing so, you change the nature of the market, you change the borrower profile, and you likely change the behavior conditional on a shock next time. So it's a kind of lucrative critique, I think, to, to this idea of these market behavior with 85% covenant light uh, for leverage uh, finance that we have never, leverage loans that we have never seen, uh, with this enormous growth of uh, CLOs. Uh, conditional on a shock, I think it's going to turn out very different than than we have based all of our credit decisions on uh, from from past behavior. I think the one distinction is that the um, I mean, part and this was mentioned to yesterday in the piece about thinking rethinking the subprime crisis is that um, the contagion effect. So to the extent that you had subprime delinquencies upticking early spring of uh, the late winter of '07. And then having this knock-on effect to all day, to prime, to conforming in different MSAs and zip codes, that was a big distinction of a tipping point of like, okay, now everyone is, is sort of uh, contaminated, right, to the extent that it's home prices, it's regional, and it's affecting uh, uh, different prices. I don't, I don't see the same way of this playing out in terms of secured, senior secured debt to junk-rated borrowers where... You know, is that going to cause a plummet in in you know office furniture prices or something? You know, I, I mean, maybe, maybe that does play out that way, but I, I, it feels more contained in terms of the type of contagion that can that can present itself. But I agree that we don't know enough yet, and I think that the the call, the continual call for the OCC and Fed and others to get more information about this market segment is important to have. I mean, just to be clear, I don't actually think that it, the next round is going to be anything like the previous ones. I think we probably are, uh, will learn more by looking at the prior two recessions, mm -hmm. the milder, uh, the one in 2001 and the 1991 recession. I agree with you. Yeah. And um, last question from my side. With a decade now of ultra low interest rates, half of the room works on low R star. Um, we have, um, it would seem like, will we look back at this in 10 years and think like, yes, but we had a decade of super easy financing conditions, very low interest rates. Wouldn't it be surprising if this haven't built up? Like, where, what is it, where, where is, what, what are we missing? I think, I think um, it's funny because, I, and I experience this in, in some of my, my work now, is um, there's a whole generation of, you think about um, interest rates trading, treasury swaps, there's a whole generation of traders and risk managers that it's like the land of the lotus eaters. They've only known low volatility, you know, they've only known complete messaging by the Fed, the dot plots, like, they don't remember the old days by us old guys are like, Greenspan's briefcase, how big is it? Is it going to be a shit? What's it going to be? And and there's an important, I remember uh, talking to Paul Volcker about this, and he, he, of course, his mind was like, do like a magic eight ball and just, you know, hey, maybe we go up, maybe we go down, just to in insert a little volatility and uncertainty. And the, the point being that there can't be this continued reliance on the Fed just to sort of be a put to the markets uh, or, to keep, or to be so clear and transparent that it's already automatically telegraphed three or four or six steps ahead as far as that path dependency. I do worry about 
the, the inability of not just market participants, but investors um, and, and, and bank, you know, you know, credit officers of not experiencing that kind of um, uncertainty and having that telegraphed completely and having that certitude in what they're underwriting and what they're doing in terms of their origination behavior. Um, I worry that that's a, a long lasting effect. That said, I don't know how you change it because what we came out of, you know, the, the, the actions that were taken under QE and other measures had to be taken. And so, I, I mean, I, I, not to be uh, King Solomon, but it's like I, I, I both admire the actions that were taken, but lament the fact that it is going to leave these long-term effects on market participants and others of, of having this kind of guaranteed sense of here's where interest rates are going to be, and they're not going to move that much. So I think Trent's point about institutional memory is worth, is worth sort of pushing on. Um, most fintechs were born after mm -hmm. the financial crisis. And so they're off happily, you know, building new credit models with uh, new sources of data based on behavior that's largely post-crisis, because um, those new data sources you know, were uh, are essentially post-crisis phenomena. Uh, and uh, their optimism about being able to suss out exactly the right credit credit behavior is kind of remarkable. Um, so I'll, I'm curious to see how it's going to pan out uh, once. Uh, once we're, you know, once a slightly harsher reality sets in. Great. Um, yes, please. Yeah, hi, Rob Duggar. I'm a board member. And uh, on behalf of the board, let me thank everybody for being here and the staff for great job for putting this together. My professional career began working for Henry Wallach at the Federal Reserve in 1971 when we, uh, we broke from the dollar. So my institutional memory is I'm 74, so that's, uh, that's both a burden and, a, and, and maybe a blessing. I don't know. But one of the things that was interesting about yesterday was uh, the, the focus on historic events and then how they translated into the, the 29 crash. So the housing bubble that we saw in the 20s was really a result of the World War I's suppression of housing construction and then the surge that occurred afterward. And then that echoed through and created conditions that contributed to the 29 crash. My question is, in 2006, foreign exchange denominated loans by Chinese borrowers amounted to about 200 to 250 billion. It now, at end of 2008, excuse me, 2018, it was about a little over two trillion. So it increased tenfold from 2006. June 2006, as you remember, was the last of 17 rate hikes. The Fed gave that last rate hike. Interesting thing about that 2006, the default rates had already started because subprime lending had already started. And when you start lending to that community, you're going to get more defaults, and the default rate was rising. The housing uh, stock index had been falling for six months when the Fed did the last hike. Seven months later, Bear Stearns declared two hedge funds gated because they had too much junk. And within sh soon after that, in 2007, we learned that, uh, that the rest of the world had about a trillion dollars of this stuff on their balance sheets, and we were frozen. I mean, this was at the Jackson Hole Conference in September 2001. That's all we talked about, nationalizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which we had to do within, within a month. Fed then cut rates 75 basis points over 45 days. OK. Um, how much of the current credit, corporate credit that you're talking about is actually loans to Chinese borrowers, because they have, they currently have the highest credit to GDP ratio in the world. It is higher than Japan's in 1990, higher than Thailand, higher than every crash we've had so far, and it's falling. Maybe looking sort of at the international environment, sort of China, and, but maybe you see other rips. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I'll say, I mean, from, from the perspective of when I was talking about the syndicated loan market, it's, it's the LSTA 100. It's the, it's the it's US based companies to the extent, though, that there is, there is definite Chinese investment in CLOs and into structured vehicles that invest in those loans. So this is part of the secondary tertiary effect of if they're in trouble, uh, coinciding with our credit troubles, that bid, right, to buy that paper fades. 
and, and that creates a collapse in that, that type of pricing and liquidity uh, in that market. So they are a pretty strong bid within that subordinate mezzanine kind of space, um, along with the, the, the Japanese as well. So I'm sorry, I'm sure answers. I don't know how much of the U.S. leverage finance is actually with the borrowers of the Chinese. I was actually thinking more that the lenders, the investors, uh, are but there are a lot of foreign investors in that market. Um, so on the other side of the equation, where uh, the Chinese, you know, are quite active. Um, I don't know how it nets out, uh, but um, you know that. That has an interesting political element about whether or not they will hold their uh, U.S. dollar, not just dollar denominated, but U.S. dollar uh, to U.S. company uh, lending <coughs> um, for economic reasons or other reasons. Um, Karen? Um, yeah, I was just I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit about the relationship between the Thank you. I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit about um, changes in financial regulation over the last couple of years. Um, and I just, I feel like on one hand that it would be really hard to believe that Dodd-Frank kind of nailed it in <laughs> Puzzle 3. Um, so of course we need refinements, but you um, hear kind of, you see media reports kind of suggesting that, oh no, there are terrible things happening, you know, we are We've weakened the stress tests in important, I mean, I know we've changed them in some ways. Um, I think there was some guidance around leverage loans that then got rolled back last couple of years. And I just can't tell whether this is, uh, you know, significant. I mean, the, you'll read about it as if it's a terrible thing and they're undoing important financial regulation. I mean, it could just be good refinements um, or it could be just not, not very consequential. So I was just wondering if you'd comment on that. Yeah, so I think I, I, one, one thing I'll, I mean, I think we got a lot of things right. <laughs> I'll, I'll start off with that. But I do think on the tweaking side of things, like, like I think with the Volcker rule, that was one where at least, I'll say from my end, there was a lot of contentious debate within, uh, within uh, the policy making sphere about um, really trying to, because it, it, it's really about trying to divine the intent of a, uh, of a dealer, of, a, of an intermediary of saying, are they taking risk for themselves or are they facilitating liquidity? And honestly, like really understanding that at a, at a very kind of um, tactical, numerical level is, is really impossible, uh, particularly in the markets we're talking about, whether it's loans or high yield instruments. So I think the work on trying to really refine that and better tweak that is actually really worthwhile at helping to facilitate liquidity. Um, one of the things that I have not, as a champion of FSOC, that I have not been thrilled with is how that's been really used as a deregulatory body. Um, so it's gone away from being an early warning system to being more about how can we, you know, uh, sort of undo some of these different constraints that DFA had led to. Um, that, that's that's worrisome for me, uh, I think. And especially with the rise of, oper I, I'm very concerned about operational risk, particularly in automated markets. I'm concerned about cybersecurity. That form had provided a really good um, a place where information could be shared around those types of issues. And I worry that that's all being kind of left to the side now. So. Yeah, no, I think that's so the FSOC point. I think is really important, actually, <clears throat> as a um, you know, as an, uh, an entity that monitors stuff. Sort of that's supposed to <clears throat> it's going to it's supposed to monitor stuff in OFR that falls through the cracks otherwise. And um, uh, to take that away, I think is really dangerous. <clears throat> I'm a little I'm a sort of a little less uh, uh, fussed about all the regulatory rollback. So, so for instance, on stress testing, <clears throat> you know, look. Um, the U.S. has had, when you compare it to other regimes, uh, the European regimes, for instance, um, has had a much harsher uh, and more thorough stress testing program that also includes a lot of the qualitative stuff. So we talk often about the quantitative. The qualitative is arguably more important, especially in sort of financial peacetime, if you will. Financial wartime in a crisis, um, it really matters, the quantitative stuff. In peacetime, it's not so obvious. And if it does, that means we got it wrong the first time. <clears throat> And here, there's been not just more quantum of capital, but the risk management practices at banks have just improved enormously. And, and to roll, you know, to sort of ease off on that doesn't seem silly to me. Uh, supervisory resources are scarce, and the Fed knows that, and so they're concentrating it progressively more and more at the really large shops and paying less attention to the smaller banks. And that seems very, very sensible. Um, uh, so I'm 
again, uh, we could we could go on to some of the other uh, parts of the uh, sort of regulatory easing, but on the stress testing, I'm not really all that fussed about how uh, about the changes. Uh, uh, Rudy Farnbrach from the Swiss Finance Institute. I studied in my research a bit the leveraged loan market in 2007, 2008, and one thing that really shocked me there is for these very large LBO deals, you had the lead arrangers sign, signing commitment letters, and then it took for half a year, a year, until the deal was actually consummated, and they could syndicate the deal or issue the high-yield bonds. And you saw that like, 250 billion or so, they were actually hung at one point in time and were stuck on the balance sheets of the banks. and. It was really bad, and now we read about the LBO market. You said oh, that it's only <coughs> 25 billion, but I wondered whether the process has changed, whether risk committees of banks, of the elite arrangers, because it's kind of a small group, whether they are more cautious, whether there's more pre-syndication, whether something has changed to mitigate these risks a little bit. Well, so I mean, the short answer is a lot <laughs> has changed. Uh, the buy box has had, had shrunk dramatically. So I think the, the the concern now is that after, have it, after it having shrunk quite a bit, with that experience in mind, things are loosening. Right? So things are loosening, and things are loosening particularly in the outside of banks. So yes, the bankers still are fairly risk averse, um, uh, but uh, the leveraged finance market is, you know, is increasingly being dominated by non-banks. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I remain not terribly worried about leveraged lending risk in banks per se. I'm more worried about stuff blowing up outside the banks, then uh, non-bank finance pulling back, and then we have to count more on banks to then step in and play their, uh, play their role of, uh, you know, sort of credit intermediaries of uh, second to last resort. I think th there's been some significant, just tactically, there's been some significant changes about warehouse financing, which is what you're describing, where the, the, the sponsors, the non-bank sponsors, are taking a lot more risk. So the banks have, have, have traditionally, when I was doing these deals, the dealer would pretty much take all the risk. Maybe we'd give 10% risk share to the sponsor. Now it's predominantly borne by the sponsors. The timelines are very tight. If the deals don't close, the, the, the warehouse is extinguished and assets are sold. Of course, they're selling into a rising market, so you could argue that's you know sort of adverse. But, um, I do think that that dynamic has changed a lot. And there's certainly, on the point about risk, you have to remember that we're coming from a place that prior to 08, the front office led everything. If you were, if you were the dealer or the trader, you told risk what they were going to do. It was very inverted. And I think that in the post-crisis era, rightfully so, risk management overall has taken much more of a leadership role and put a lot harder uh, constraints in place around value at risk, around balance sheet usage, and about other types of risk limits um, that no one really debates anymore. There's there's not a lot of pushback anymore from the, from the business end. No, I just wanted to bring it back to the consumer credit market for a second, Stefania Albanese, University of Pittsburgh, and follow up on your point on fintech uh, that has grown massively after the crisis in a low interest rate environment and a growing economy. And there has been some work on fintech um, consumer lending, suggesting that the performance of loans you know, to similar borrower has been better by uh, in fintech loans than it has for uh, conventional lenders. And it reminds me a little bit of, you know, MBSs and CDSs on uh, real estate uh, when we hadn't seen a large reduction in home prices and they really didn't know how to value um, and, and, and monitor a risk of a large downturn on the housing market. Now, fintech companies are not bank companies, but they get a lot of investment and resources from traditional banks. So. I just wanted to get your perspective on the fintech market from a systemic perspective and the spillovers potentially on you know, conventional banks and other you know, financial investors. Um, so uh, I don't take an enormous amount of comfort in uh, the observation that their, their loan performance uh, you know, controlling for risk characteristics is better now because it reminds me again of this story of uh, you know subprime <coughs> perform better than all day and so everybody piles into that. Um, the performances you know we'll have to see how how it how they pan out in uh, in a in a recession. And at least my uh, interaction with the fintech community has been uh, I'm surprised at the uh, your, your point about you know first line second line risk management versus business. Uh, the absence of appreciation for and knowledge about risk governance and risk management as a role in the uh, in the credit process is a little is a little scary. Now, 
there's not a lot of it, right? So the fintech sector isn't that big yet. So if it if it goes really south there, it's not obvious to me that that's going to matter enormously. I, but uh, but I don't I you know I'm not sure I I feel that 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 should make me uh, you know sleep easy at night. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think I mean, it's a small segment, right? So, so to the extent that there's systemic implications, I think the systemic implications have more to do with potential operational risk if there's scalability. So if the technology is adopted by a bank and there are proper either model validation or risk controls around processes and, and procedures, whether it's origination or retaining risk, that's a concern uh, that could become systemic. But I think um, overall, I'm very, I'm very happy to see a lot of different fintech innovation. I think that it's sort of fostered, particularly to the extent that there's greater access of finance to non-traditional participants in the, in, the, in the economy or the underbanked. I think those are good things. Um, but I, I think that the absence of, of, of risk-mindedness is, you think about, think about mortgage origination, right, to the GSEs. They don't have, they don't really worry about the credit box because they just take what the credit box from Fannie and Freddie is and conform to that. Um, so, so that, that's maybe not as concerning, but once that starts to migrate into the all-day dented prime, you know, alternative type borrower, that could be concerning. Thank you. <clears throat> Kathleen Stephenson, I'm a trustee for the AXA Equitable Mutual Funds. Um, so you talked about the, till about the accelerator. To what extent do you find it as a silver lining to this narrative, the fact that a lot of the leverage, corporate leverage, has been used to buy back stocks or pay out dividends? Does this ring fence in a way the real economy in case there is a bubble burst in the sense that we haven't seen a direct linkage to a major acceleration in investment spending in the real economy. So uh, I'm not sure I understood you right. I think what you might be viewing as a feature I view as a bug. So um, if I if I borrow if I to use leverage finance to buy back shares, I have a lower shock cushion than I did before, so I should be less well prepared for a shock coming than better prepared. So unless I misunderstood you, the phenomenon that you described is, the, is a very dark lining on the cloud as opposed to a silver one. I'm looking at it from a macro standpoint that if you do have this, you might essentially, the, the knock-on effect might be less direct, if you will, to the real economy. Yeah, again, that's not obvious to me. Um, in fact, I would uh, <coughs> think a little harder about this, but I would think maybe actually exactly the opposite, right? So if, if a corporation is now more highly levered than they were before, uh, and they experience a shock, they're gonna, they're gonna be they will have to be more risk averse uh, because they are well. They're they're a riskier entity because they have more leverage. Um, if the cost of borrowing, because they might have borrowed this at a very low rate, is low, they can probably withstand that uh, uh, reasonably well. I mean, this you know, there's a lot of moving parts here, but on its own, it's not obvious to. Uh, I, I don't I don't see why I should be comforted by that, and I don't see how. The financial accelerator would be used. Richard, please. Are you guys concerned about a credit crisis? Are you guys concerned about a credit crisis in China and other kind of satellite Asian satellites of China? I mean, I am. I mean, I have been for some time. Um, I think so this this is the same kind of a, a amount of astonishment I've had about an extension of our own cycle sort of can be extended to, to China. I mean, I, I've been kind of impressed in some ways, I guess, or mystified at how the, every time there seems to be some kind of kindling that forms around uh, defaults, recidivism, or, uh, or, or credit problems, it just seems to wipe away uh, in terms of government support and, 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 and other types of measures. So um, I do worry about it. I don't, I don't know exactly what we can do about it, um, quite frankly. And so my policymaking hat goes from the things I can worry about to then the what I can actually do about things that I worry about. And that's one of those things that maybe it's like uh, 
the boogeyman. It's out there, but uh, well, the one thing you could do, uh, which is being done, is to include a China meltdown in a stress scenario. Sure. Uh, and that banks are doing, and in fact, it's been an explicit part of uh, the PRA's stress scenario for a while. Is uh, you know assume that the China, uh, Chinese credit is melting down. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, thank you. Similar question. Um, on the international side, uh, not China, but BIS has recently been documenting uh, U.S. dollar lending uh, from the euro dollar market into emerging countries, say Brazil, Argentina, much of the emerging world has started tapping into the uh, corporate debt markets uh, and, 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 do and dollar markets. So U.S.-based offshore lending doesn't involve necessarily U.S. institutions, but is in, in a dollar in a dollar-denominated uh, setting, um, so that, uh, from 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 the perspective of the functional functional reg regulator's perspective, um, that falls into the same category, but now the uh, same category of of lending of repo markets that was sort of uh, intimated what we call shadow banking, maybe in the pre-crisis environment, but now it's not happening with the U.S. Uh, institutions' involvement, but it's happening in an emerging market setting with uh, British banks uh, or British actors uh, involving those, those types of uh, credit cycles. So I'm wondering now, from a US perspective, um, how do you view that kind of development? Is it, is it on the radar? Um, or how do you intermediate with the euro dollar market from a regular perspective, uh, since that will some, in some way uh, come to the banking sector at some point? Because uh, from what you said from the stress test perspective, the ability of the U.S. banking system to extend loans into Europe uh, or other places is a critical factor to mediate any crisis of liquidity in those markets, potentially, if we don't want to rely on the Fed to use their swap lines. Yeah, I, just one comment overall on the international front post-crisis that's really important. And I, I saw this <coughs> with both LIBOR, I saw it with housing finance reform and, and derivative reform. There's such a more tightly linked communication channel between the United States, the UK, the Europeans, and, and, and emerging, emerging market central bankers. Um, and, and so to the extent that you have different channels, whether it's through ECB systemic risk committees or um, uh, you know, the, the FCA uh, and their sponsorship of different systemic risk efforts, there is a lot more coordination. So there's a lot more conversation that happens. I think that the, the the, the core of what I always want to see is the data. So, um, you know, and that's the part that's harder, I think, to share around, um, uh, given those kinds of constraints. So when we do ask about bilateral repo or unsecured financing and what that may look like and trying to understand the linkages and chains of transmission, um, that's something we always wanted to try to fill in as a map, not just for the United States, but for linkages of FBOs uh, operating in the United States. But um, also heavily relied upon counterparties overseas. Um, and I, I, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot more that we could do there. I think IOSCO has tried to do that from a dealer uh, security side. Um, but but there's, a, there's definitely a, a lot more of a need for that because frankly, the replication of, of the same kind of fire runs is, is, is uh, fire, you know, forced selling is likely to happen in uh, those kinds of situations. Let me <clears throat> um, sort of uh, ask a bigger picture question of, um, you know, we, we, Hyman Minsky had this uh, sentence that stability is destabilizing. The idea being that, like, it's in the it's in the peace, it's in the quiet times, or we still call them in peace time, uh, when we all convince ourselves that things are actually under control. Regulators are talking to each other. Risk management practices have improved. That's when somewhere mm -hmm. the the sort of the the the, the building gets, um, the, fund, the fundamentals of the building get weakened. Someone is digging right now under our feet trying to uh, exploit that. What are we, what are we, uh, question, what are we missing? Something is, is, are we really here saying like this is the post-crisis decade, people are so scarred still from the decade, they haven't done any bad things. So are there, what's, what are the risks we're not having on the horizon? Is it that interest rates could be higher again at some point? Is it, what is it that, what's, what's missing? I think, I think uh, and I alluded to this earlier, uh, it's a great point, and frankly, they, they used to call my office and my staff the, the, the doomsday or say, doomsday sayers of the Treasury because we were the most glum people thinking about the worst things, you know, that could happen. But I think that um, one of the most un, under under uh, studied or, or recognized risks is around operational and cyber, and the reason why is because it's not understood. I mean, you talk to most 
leaders of companies, of government agencies, of central banks. They just have real, really no grasp of it. And meanwhile, it's a truly destabilizing type of exposure and vulnerability. It's not one that fits within our defined classical models of economic theory, of self-interest, of, 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 of booms and busts. And so um, I think it's something that we need to have more of a spotlight on in terms of um, what is infrastructural integrity, whether it's in automated trading markets or it's within mainframes that are supporting credit and lending and other bank operations, because it's something where uh, there are, as we saw with Bank Bangladesh and the theft of almost a billion dollars from the New York Fed, there are highly organized nation state sponsors that not just want to get money, they want to disrupt the American economy, they want to disrupt the developed economies. So. If I'm, if I'm really, uh, that's something that keeps me up at night. Yeah. Till is it, is the, it the European it banks that keep you up at night? <laughs> oh, no, no, I mean, Fred took the words right out of my mouth. You know, I was going to you could say the quip that if I, you know, if I knew I wouldn't be here, I'd know what to short. Um, and I'd be shorting it, but I don't know how to short that. <laughs> I know. Uh, uh, and that really worries me. I have a piece uh, in the Harvard Business Review on the tenth, uh, it's like right on the tenth anniversary of Lehman Brothers, where I basically the colleagues speculate, you know, what might be the trigger for the financial crisis. And I actually think it would be a cyber event. And one of the reasons I worry, especially about a cyber event, is because it's not obvious what a central bank would do. Uh, the countermeasures are really not obvious. We are just, you know, we haven't seen anything like this. It's something that really we don't know much about. Um, and what do you have in mind as a cyber event? Is this like Mr. Robot type, the data you raise? Well, you know, my favorite nightmare scenario is a data integrity. So one day you wake up and you realize, oh, you know, the data that I have in my system, I think it's quite right. But I don't know when it became wrong. Yes. Um, and so as that, you know, leaks out, um, you don't it's have a the source of yeah. truth. Anymore, and there's a there's a lack of confidence. So that's one, and whether or not that spills over into the into the, into the central bank, right? So does the central bank uh, know when is is the central bank data uh, uh, corrupted? And even if they say that it isn't, should we believe them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to run exercises around similar data corruption, also um, be, uh, effectively theft. Right, so large-scale transfer of monies um, leading to a bank that can't settle at end of day. And if they can't settle at end of day against their counterparties, creating a liquidity crisis. So a lot of the, the exercises we would do is around, well, what's the communication channel? Like, nobody even knew who to talk to. It's like the, 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 the chief information officer, does he talk to the treasurer? Does he talk to the, the, the liquidity repo? Debt? Like, and when does it go to the CEO to communicate to the Fed? Or when should the, like... All those different things, which frankly, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I mean, to be sure, it's not like banks are not not, not clueless about this. This has been the number one mm -hmm. risk uh, in the for CROs five six years. Right. Maybe. It is, uh, and it's not moving away from that. But I think for all for all, I, I agree with that. But I think for all the, the 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 academics in the room, this is an area of study. I mean, I, mean, I think there's way. Too, I'll say it, I think there's way too much of looking at the pterodactyls that might attack us. You know. I mean, the ABCP is not coming back, folks. You know, it's just not going to represent it. The, the crisis isn't going to manifest itself the same way. So I think this is a frontier. Um, I'll put it out as an open bid. I'd love to work on some, some pieces like that. So. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.